I wanted to get uh, get the conversation going tonight with a little icebreaker. We have a lot of familiar faces, but some new people. So, um, oh, actually, before we get going, let me just mention there's a couple of different ways that you can participate tonight. Um, there's a lot of us tonight. So in order to kind of like direct traffic, Madeline and I will be tag teaming as your facilitators tonight. So I will facilitate the first half of the meeting and around midway, we will switch and um, I'll take a break and Madeline will come on. And my role as facilitator is to just kind of direct traffic. So um, if you would like to join in on the conversation, um, you please use the hand raise function um, down at the bottom of your screen and I will call on you. So keep yourself muted until I call on you and then you can unmute yourself and contribute to the discussion. Um, you can also work the chat. So typically in these meetings, we kind of have, um, we have a lively chat and then also discussion and we kind of work back and forth uh, between those. So please feel, um, feel welcome to uh, participate however you feel comfortable. So our first prompt tonight um, that, uh, I want to ask you all is um, it's kind of an icebreaker. Uh, uh, please uh, introduce yourself and let us know uh, or tell the group how do you access a studio? Do you um, do you rent a studio? Do you have your own shop? Do you work at an institution? What's your workspace like? And let me pull up my uh, the chat here so I can see. Whoops. There we go. All right. So, um, yeah. So would anybody like to, uh, to chime in and introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your workspace. I can tell you about mine. I I'm right here. I'm at Salem community college tonight where I teach and, uh, it's a big group studio and it's a school. And I also have a private studio in Brooklyn, um, that just, I work at, um, with assistance. And so how that works is, Sometimes when I'm making my own work, I need some private time to work in my own space. And that's when I'll work in my own studio, but I'm limited in firepower and in tools there. So um, when the projects get to the point where there's extra equipment that I need, or I need a bigger team, I'll come down to school, um, Salem Community College and work down here. And down here, I have a, a, a huge community. And um, so lots of extra hands, um, extra equipment that I don't have access to in my studio. Um, so for me, it's, I've always kind of tried to maintain two working spaces, one private and one more um, community oriented. And that way I have kind of options depending on what I'm working on at the time. So I don't know, do any of you um, have a situation like that? Oh, Madeline. Hey all, oh, I just got a message. My internet's unstable, so apologies in advance if I break out. Um, anyway, so yeah, I kind of have a similar situation. I used to have my own um, flame shop in my downstairs when I lived in a little carriage house. Then we moved um, and, you know, I came back to Philly and I've been primarily teaching out of, or, or uh, flame working out of the places I teach. And I have a long-term project where I'm setting up my own flame shop in my backyard, but it's I'm hoping it's my forever home. I never have to like set it up again. Um, so I'm, it's a long project. We like tore down an old shed. We're building it back up. Um, we're doing it slowly, but I'm hoping we're doing it right. Um, but in the meantime, I'm working out of, I, I worked a lot out of Tyler School of Art last year because I, I was adjuncting there and they have a pretty good flame shop. Um, and then also right now I'm, I'm primarily working out of Salem where I'm also teaching. So I, I think like it's great having a shared space because, you know, if you're I'm working on a big fabrication project right now, for instance, and being in a shared space where I can just sort of zone out and like do that kind of fun, like uh, monotonous work. It's really great to do around other people because I don't need to spend 100 percent of my concentration you know working on that and being like no one talk to me i'm putting my blinders on um so i have certain projects that i do at my you know at a shared space i'm like that'll be perfect to do at school and then certain ones where i'm like okay this is me being kind of vulnerable doing some weird stuff like staring into space for a little bit and like 
I can't, like I have a thread of thought that's so delicate that I, I need to maintain it and not be interrupted um, or afraid of being interrupted. So that's the type of thing I, I'm going to do at home once I have my own space. Um, but I, I agree, like I like to switch it up. Personally, I think it's a nice thing to, if you have multiple spaces to sort of experience ideas like in private and in public um, and, and work on works in those two different settings personally. Uh, Davis. Hello, welcome. Hi, nice to see everyone. Hi. Um, so I have my own flame working studio that I rent um, that recently has kind of downsized. So I, um, it's kind of a private studio and I don't use it too much per se because I don't have a lot of personal projects right now. I also work at Tyler where I'm a technician as well. So I would say I approach that studio a little bit cautiously because I know that once I am taken away from my projects, that'll really, you know, happen. Uh, but one thing I was just kind of thinking about is that I'm also hoping to get more studio mates in my studio, which is uh, at the Loom in North Philly. And immediately one thing I think about is like, who is that all accessible to? Because I'm looking for new studio mates, but I'm also like, I want to make sure I'm not, um, exposing people to Kensington because that's a little bit of an issue around that area. And like, I've dealt with it for a long time. Um, and the loom is full of flame workers because it's one of the only buildings that kind of allows it. So that's another thing I kind of worry about, but I definitely enjoy and feel super grateful and lucky to have a private space and a public space because sometimes it does get too quiet and monotonous and sometimes it does get too distracting. And Davis, just to clarify for the folks who aren't familiar with the Philly scene, um, when, when you say expose people to Kensington, uh, can you just, it's a safety, right? It's like a little bit it's of a rough thing. neighborhood. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's a lot of artists and artist studios. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Mo's. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, sweet. This is the uh, first time with uh, the new computer. Um, so I am currently at my studio. Um, it is, you guys can see, kiln, glass, glass. Um, it's a really cool <laughs> space. It's actually a lot bigger than what you can see. Um, I, it's still a work in progress. Um, so I got the space in like July, um, last year. And before that I was actually, um, in you seen it. I have a 40 foot shipping container, um, that I solar powered. And then I was, um, kind of flame working there, but like trying to get power to my, this kiln. Um, it was really hard with the generator and then I moved to solar. And then that was still hard because it just required a lot of solar panels to just keep the thing running. Um, and then I recently, some awesome things happened in my life and I got this space. Um, there's no current flame working um, yet because I actually, the space is a historic building. It's called the Tannery Art Center. It actually used to be a tannery place where they dyed leathers back in the day. So it's a historic building that's been in Santa Cruz for a while. And Santa Cruz is, you know, number two highest renting place in the country. So everything is like red tape. You're like, you gotta walk. You need red, you know, it's just like, it's, it's everything's just like crazy. So I have to order everything I need, um, which right now is just like the ventilation. I got fa uh, fan I already own get the ducting, all that. And then I have to draw up blueprints. And then I have to submit those to the city. And then they have to look at the like blueprints and be like, okay, this makes sense. I understand this. And then they have to send someone here. And then they have to be like, okay, you didn't break any code. Um, because like I said, I can't drill into any historic things. So all the beans up here, I have like, 20 foot ceilings or more um so but i have a skylight right here so i can like and the skylight's like corrugated panel so i can do a drop down from there but i can't like like fixture anything to the wall or these beams to hold it in place so i have to do like this whole thing um and it's not a cheap feat 
Um, so I'm just like taking my time with it. And I, instead of just like hiring someone just to be like, here, here's the thousands of dollars, do it. You know, I kind of want to take the steps in the process because as I go through my entrepreneurial journey, um, it's just going to require a lot of understanding how the city works, dealing with Santa Cruz, if I plan on, you know, spending the rest of my life here, um, which I do for, for a very long time. Um, so that's happening. It's, um, it's, I'm in the works. Um, there's some, you know, I'm just stacking the funds to be able to give it away for someone to say, okay, do it. Um, and then when I'm not doing, um, when I'm not here, which this will be just predominantly flame working, I have a 220 volt as well. So I'll be able to get big kiln and all this stuff. It's, uh, it's really cool space. Um, I'm at Baggins, so Bay Area Glass Institute. Um, and I've been there mostly for like the last almost two years. Um, it's where I do a lot of the hot shop stuff. Well, it's where I do all the hot shop stuff. I also flame work there. I recently helped these two awesome ladies when they came through Helen and Amy, um, when they did, when they, when they blessed us with their demos and lectures. So that was really fun. Cause that's a, a way for me to interact with the community as well. Um, I'm not in like the pipe community or whatever. And me being me, I'm an only child. So me just having this space and no, um, mates is awesome. Like I am, you know, everything has a place. So if I had like a shot mate move, something like that, I would flip out. It would just, it pissed me off when about to be almost 40 years old. I don't need to be dealing with that stuff. So having my own space where I can just have things where they are and I know where they are is like ideal for me. I will pay, I'll pay extra for that at this point in my life. That's just, that's just me. Um, I've done the, like, you know, all the shop mates and, you know, all the weird stuff that happens along with that. I'm sure you guys are hundred percent familiar with that. Um, so that's where I'm currently at. Um, the goal is to be able to, um, do demos here. Um, on first Fridays, we have like first Friday, big demos and stuff like that. I have a really cool, um, situation that I want to work with that. And then eventually, um, maybe either a partnership or with some other people in developing and buying a warehouse somewhere. Um, that would be the dream to just be able to own the building and just build something out. And, um, but you know, it's, it's a stepping stone like everything. Thanks, Mose. Hey, also, I know, well, I know a little bit about your working situation. And I also know that flame working equipment is portable and you've set it up at other venues around your region, right? Like, didn't you have it set up at Treehouse? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. um, you know, everything mostly, I mean, besides the new, um, table there from Uline, mostly everything's on wheels. Um, mm -hmm. so a lot of things that I do, um, just like doing demos around town or things like that. I try to put on wheels, um, to just do flame working demos. You know, I think as a broke artist back in the day, I just always was like moving around. We all are, we've all been there like, Hey, this worked for a few months and then we got to move. So I was like, you know, let me, um, put stuff on wheels just in case if shit happens. Right. Um, so, you know, I've been able to do a bunch of demos around town and that's because like my, it's not here now, but it's in my, my other space at my container, um, long table where I just put it on wheels and, um, was able to move certain things around, you know, you guys know flame working is super accessible, um, mm -hmm. a tank and, you know, uh, a tabletop and you're good to go with your torch. So mm -hmm. that's something that I, I always want to kind of keep as well is, uh, the mobility of being able to kind of stay um accessible and mobile with the flame mm. work. Awesome. But it feels good to finally have like a commercial space that like is mine. I think that's the goal for totally that's the dream. It looks awesome in there. I know you've been doing a lot of work. It looks good. Yeah I um <laughs> thank you. You should see it in night mode. It's pretty cool. All right. Well, in a little bit later, we'll we'll do some little micro studio tours. So maybe uh, we can get we can circle back around. But awesome, thank you, Sally. Hello, hello. Let's see if I can do this. Um, yeah, I I've had a lot of studios. Um, I when I was little, I set up in my parents' basement and did it really poorly. And now I have a really nice studio in my home. Um, I had the building inspector through and all that. So it's all cleared and everything. Um, 
but I also work at, up at the University of Vermont and UMass Amherst where we rent out time for people. Um, just like the rest of you, it's nice to have some time where you're not getting interrupted constantly. You know, when I'm at work at either of those places, it's a constant interruption. So it's really nice to have my home studio for when I need quiet time. That's all. <laughs> Nice. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, I I agree with that. Uh, Surf Rat, welcome back. Hello. Oh, you're muted. There you go. Hi. Yeah, I'm Brian Ratcliffe, uh, Surf Rat. Um, along with the theme, I also kind of have a home studio and then work at another studio. Uh, I worked at home for a long time and throughout, you know, early pandemic and all that stuff. And then really wanted to work on a lathe, wasn't able to find a lathe to buy or access. And so was able to rent space, uh, with my friend, uh, the big Z glass studio. He had a lathe for me to work on, which was really cool. It's been really fun and great for my body and fun to expand that, uh, skill set. And also it's been really nice to, you know, work with some other people uh, when, you know, when that's when when that's kind of what I want or what I'm looking for. And also a cold working shop has been really exciting to be able to cold work and not have that in because I have a garage studio. So I didn't really want to have that in the same spot to be able to have that in a separate room and to be able to have a sandblaster and things like that. It's been really big. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Kristen. Hi. Hey, sorry, I was unmuting me. <laughs> You're all good. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, my husband and I have been running studios, uh, flame working studios now for over 20 years. So we've built a couple different ones. Um, we've done the home studio. Um, we did that for many, many years. Uh, we had a flame working studio. And then in the back, we turned an old greenhouse into a hot shop. Mm. Um, and then, uh, when we moved up here, we weren't sure where our studio was going to be at first. So we actually built a studio in a school bus. And so we built a lamp working studio in the school bus and, um, we made that work with, for us for a while. Um, and then we got to kind of a random spot, um, when we first moved up here to Canada and, uh, ended up having a blow glass in our basement, which was beyond horrible. <laughs> Uh, it was the tiniest thing and trying to get tanks in and out during the winter time through the alleyway. And oh my gosh, it was just, and my husband was ingenious how he was able to set up ventilation, but like the ceilings were like, so low. it was just awful and um, no access, right? No public access to where we are because there just weren't any studios. There's not really anything um, within like many, many hours of where we are. So um, not really worth it for us to like go and, find a place to work at that point. We, we'd always been kind of do it ourselves anyway. So um, when we finally fought our, found our spot here, part of finding our spot here was that we wanted to be able to have a home studio and, um, and have it be large enough to be able to ac accommodate um, what we wanted to be able to do. And after 20 years of doing something, obviously, as you all know, you, you tend to get a lot of equipment and a lot of stuff that kind of goes along with it. So <laughs> um, at this point, I don't even know if I could go to another studio. I feel like I, we've been really good about kind of like building our space to be very comfortable. And I love the fact that I can literally walk out my back door and like 20 feet away, be like, and now I'm at work, you know, turn on the kiln, go back in the house, make breakfast, come back out. Okay, everything's warmed up, you know? So um, that's like a super awesome thing. Um, at our studio, we do have uh, um, production work that we do every week. So I guess part of what I'm able to do as far as separating having like um, public time versus more private time is that our production time is from nine to noon every single day. So in the studio, nine to noon, everyone's working. Everyone's kind of in their groove. Um, if there's teams of people working together, then that's happening at that point. And then um, in the evening time, everyone has an opportunity then to kind of branch off and work on their own. There, it, things are a little bit more silent. People put on their headphones and kind of ignore the people around them a little bit more, I guess you'd say. <laughs> um, 
also in the evening time, it tends to be me in the lamp studio. And then my husband has a larger lathe in our other barn. And so he ends up being out in that area whereas I'm then in this area. And then that gives me my own space to do my own thing and, you know, turn on lame nineties music and just rock out and sing along, you know, whatever it is that I'm doing <laughs> because he's always complaining about my music. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's kind of, I think we've kind of made it work here. That's awesome. That sounds like a dream situation. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, we, um, uh, as I mentioned last time we talked, he is contracted to do scientific work. Um, but because of where we're located, um, one of the reasons we got the contract is because of our location. And so um, we had to bring the equipment in house at that point. So there isn't like a place where we would go and then do that work. Does that make sense? Right. There's like a yeah. school we would go to or like, you know, working at Salem per se. Right. Right. Where you have that right. the, that there. So we've kind of had to make those those things happen for us here. Yeah. It's I'm just looking at the chat, the chat here. And it sounds like um, Alyssa is uh, is far pretty far away from any public studio as well and has made a studio space in their garage. So I think um, yeah, yeah. that's another way to go, too. And then, you know, your your studio is easily accessible and private and um you know so everybody has like such a different work situation depending on who you are and what you're making and you know where you're located and uh jerry also um uh, and Alyssa's in oklahoma jerry's in new jersey and jerry has a home studio as well a flame shop with four torches and does rentals and teaches so um that's that's pretty great. And New Jersey is a place where I'm in New Jersey now. That's in a, a place where um, it's not too difficult to set up a situation like that. So um, as far as red tape goes. So that's awesome. She's got kilns and cold working equipment and all kinds of stuff over there. And it sounds like uh, continuing to build out. So the studio is ever evolving. Uh, Percy. Hello. Well, hello, hello, Percy here. Um, I uh, <laughs> I work at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, and um, I've been really interested in doing neon. And so, one of the things that's kind of interesting being at the Pittsburgh Glass Center is it is a public access studio, so visitors can walk in and see people working blow glass and ask questions. Mm. So it's not um, so it's a bit more public than some other studios may have, sort of like the halfway point on that. And I actually enjoy that. Sometimes a little interruption is is great during my workflow. Uh, but other than that, uh, it can be very challenging depending on the season in terms of scheduling yourself to get in the studio. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing that's happening at the Pittsburgh Glass Center is we are getting ready to break ground for our expansion. And that means over the last few years, um, sans the pandemic, uh, but when we're operational, we've been ramping up how much can we fit in this facility before it's not enough? And uh, that has also changed seasonally. So you could imagine during the, the fall session, you have pumpkins and you have uh, Halloween stuff and you have ornaments and you have all these different things that's packed. And then now shifting into spring, it's some more so like getting ready for the summer, which means we have more multi-week classes. And so when more multi-week classes mean you have bigger times uh, timestamps taken out of the studio spaces. So you end up kind of challenging getting into the studio and whenever your normal schedule is, it's, it's a bit different each time. Um, but other than that, um, I additionally find some sort of limitation with how the studio has been built. So we do have our ventilation directly over every single one of our torches or our benches. And if I'm doing something with neon or I'm handling a long tube, I end up finding myself having to kind of adjust to this overhanging just above my head standing and trying to get my tools in there. But in, in thinking about, well, what happens if I don't have access? Well, I, like, I mean, that's the flexibility of flame working or just having the neon equipment in general is, is, you know, your torches, you can take that home and set it up pretty easily. My plan B is being out on the porch. Um, I haven't set it up yet, but I've done demonstrations outside. Um, so having a bit of wind ca coverage can go a long way with being able to work with some of these torches out on the patio. In Pittsburgh, huh? Working outside? 
Yep. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Yeah, I've done it before. Yeah, you just got to have some kind of wind covering. You're good to go. Cool. That's awesome. Thanks, Percy. Helen. Hey, thanks for joining us. Hi. Yeah, I'm just, I'm going to chime in on this topic and then I apologize. I'm going to dip out because I got to, I got to go do mom time for the evening. Um, but it's just fun to listen to this conversation. I'm not a flame worker. I'm a glass blower. Um, I've been an institutional leech my whole career. Like I've always had some relationship to some teaching institution, whether I was a student or a grad student or whether I was teaching as a technical instructor or as faculty or as staff high school, college, uh, weekend warrior, like everything under the sun, but it's always been like an institution that I've like leached off of. <laughs> um, and I recently went back to the Bay, um, as Mose mentioned, and it was really like, uh, I guess humbling to kind of like go back to my life there. Cause the hustle used to be so crazy. Like I remember there was this one moment where uh, within 24 hours, I taught college students at CCA, and then I bombed into SF and taught weekend warriors like at nighttime. And then I drove down to Palo Alto and taught high school kids the next morning. Like that was one 24 hour cycle. And it was just like the worst. <laughs> um, but it also like um, was a good reminder for me that, you know, like I live in Madison now. I've been here for 10 years. I'm one of the few unicorns that like has the great privilege of um, holding a university position. Um, but it's humbling to remember that, like, that's like the entire reason I'm here is access to like this amazing program and facility. All right. I'm going to go do mom awesome. time. It's really great okay. to listen to this tiny bit. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thanks for yes. your time. Great to see you. <laughs> Likewise. Yes. All right. And as for those of you who don't know, Helen's the, the director and the founder of Geeks. Um, and we also have another um, Geeks staff member, Ben Orozco, here today. So I'm just going to put you on the spot for a minute and say thanks for joining us. <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. Yes. I, yeah. I do a little bit of flame working. I'm, my background is in neon, and I do have equipment. So I live on uh, our family has a farm in Wisconsin, which is outside of Madison. And I do have some neon equipment set up in a some neon torches set up in a tractor garage but it's very very initial stages so that's where I'm at with my studio practice I do a lot of other artwork outside of glass so it's kind of been in the back burner so that's where I'm at awesome thanks Ben um so I want to kind of segue a little bit to kind of extend this question to um ask you all as a student or a co-learner um, do you take classes at facilities or go to a facility, a studio of some sort to learn about glass blowing or exchange information with other people? Uh, and if so, um, is there a particular format that you like or a particular kind of studio that you like to go to or don't like to go to to do that? Um, for example, we've had people chiming in in the past about preferring to do like a webinar from their own studio when they're in their own studio using their own torch and accessing the teaching content through like um, Discord or Twitch or, you know, Zoom or something like that. Whereas, you know, another option would be uh, traveling to somewhere like say Corning Museum of Glass and taking a class, a group class at their studio with other artists in person. Um, so just curious to know, um, uh, your thoughts and preferences on uh, educational spaces and um, whether that's self-directed or um, organized. Davis, hello. Hey, I made a resolution last year that I was like, anywhere I go now, I'm just going to teach so I can get in there. And then very quickly, I was like, I think I'm going to go be a student again for a little bit and take some classes some places because... Basically, I'm going, I like hot blowing, I like flame working. And so I would like to force myself to do more like mold making, casting, kiln forming things. So if in the future I do seek those out, I'm going to try to seek out what's like the most opposite of what I actually like. So I can kind of round out what I know. Makes sense. Makes sense. My personal preference is I, I like, um, I like to travel to another studio uh, and make it kind of a destination um, excursion to take a class. 
And I love that experience of just meeting new people. We're all from different places and we all travel to go to the studio and take class. Um, so that, that situation really works for me, kind of combining travel and learning. And then I go back to my own studio and um, I prefer for that to be like a space where I can just kind of let my mind wander and, and let my creativity flow in my own space and not have it be structured in terms of like teaching happening in my own space currently. But at different times in my life, that's shifted as well. So I think that's another thing. Studio practice tends to be kind of fluid for all of us over time. Um, yeah, Madeline. Um, I like to go, well, basically the, the, a huge formative part of my flame working education, besides being self-taught a lot in the beginning is, um, taking workshops, especially when I was in school and between school. So, um, I basically went wherever I could get a scholarship to take a class. So I got them at Pittsburgh glass center and Corning. And once I got one at Pilshuk, but like many years in a row, consistently, um, those institutions like, uh, PGC and Corning, like have really, you know, been so wonderful with scholarship and making these classes accessible for someone like me at the time who was just a student, like, you know, with no income. Um, so that's a huge thing. That's, and, and I think that's great. Like the other thing is like going into a new shop, even if you have your own, I feel like it's kind of nice because it gets you out of your comfort zone, like in your own shop. Like I just kind of roll up and I'm like, here I am like same scenery, everything's the same. And then in a, in a new shop, for better or for worse, everything's a little different. And um, it can be, I usually write off the first day of a class. I'm like, I'm not going to do anything amazing the first day. Like, not that that's the goal anyway, but like, because for me, there's always a little bit of a struggle, like getting used to the torch. Every torch is slightly different personality. Like, you know, the, the, the sort of subtleties of the space, maybe it's a different type of glass. So um, I'm always like the, the first day might be a wash cause, cause you have to get used to the difference, but I also think that's really freeing, um, and like and really enriching to, to work in a new space and meet new personalities, um, and stuff like that. And I just want to chime in here and echo, uh, uh, a line from the chat here, um, that Alyssa mentioned, uh, applying her, that her favorite way to learn is applying for scholarships to craft schools each summer. Um, and so that's another thing when you access these, try to access these institutional spaces, there's an opportunity um, to apply for scholarships and funding. And um, whereas that might not be the situation if you're um, under your own power in your own studio. So um, that could be a, a, a draw to um, go to a institution to seek out its uh, instruction or classes. Sally. Um, yes, I, I recently was thinking about a class at Penland School of Crafts, and one reason I like there is the food is so excellent, you know, like, basically, they give you studio space and say, here you go, and you just go for it, and then the cooks are making you wonderful food. Um, I also like to to go around the world, you know, take a class in a different culture, um, and then you know, then learn about that culture while you're learning whatever you're taking your class in. Um, I think that's a lot of fun. That sounds fabulous. I hope to be able to do that someday. And then, you know, if you're if you're uh, blowing glass while you're traveling, then, you know, you have a mode of expression right there. So that's pretty great. Uh, Mose. Yeah, you're up. Sorry, I was, uh, I'm on That's multitasking. Okay. I, got, I got class in <laughs> like an hour and a half, so I'm trying to okay. do more. Well. Okay. Um, I think in the beginning, for um, it was amazing. Like Sally said, um, I was able to take my first class with the two week with Emilio and Simone, and I think Amber was also there. I think she was just hanging out, but she like TA. So it was like Emilio, Amber, Simone, and Davide was next door in the hot shop with like Dan Alexander um, and a bunch of new people that I, I just met. So like, I think when like starting off and even when I guess you get older, um, but in the beginning for sure, having so many inspiring people in um, so much experience is um, an amazing thing. I think that is like, you know, key to really, um, you know, success. Um, I remember like, it was like Davide was drunk and we were downtown Corning and he kind of gave me this, this, 
this, you know, it was like a statement kind of communication conversation. And it really like touched me because it was like, I was just starting out and he was just, he said something like, um, it's not my glass that makes me who I am. He's like, it's me, Davide. I'm me. And that really is like spoke to me on being like personality, who you are sticking true to yourself is like how you, how you become, you know, the person you want to be, not the, necessarily the thing you make or whatever, but the, the character. Um, and then I was able to, um, you know, I started off as an apprentice and then obviously Salem and Penland as well. And in the beginning stages, taking all those classes and traveling, sleeping on friends' couches, um, just, you know, lighting the torch or jumping in the hot shop to bring bits and punties, all that stuff is, is amazing. I, that, that is, I would, I give a lot of my success to just being humble in the beginning and just going for it and, you know, eating, you know, beans and rice and ramen and just listening to what these masters who've been doing it for 30 something years have to say and just involving yourself in the, the, the craft. Um, I would highly recommend that. I, I think that's like, you know, that that's, that's, that's what helped me nowadays. Um, I think as you get more established or just for me speaking, um, it's harder to put myself in that situation now. I think I just gotten comfortable. Um, so now, especially I'm trying to like really embody new work and I'm really trying to take in the essence of that work, like the energy, the visions, the creativity. So I need like, I need that thing to be where it's going to be. You know, I just need to like see it and envision it. Um, and I don't need anyone to like be blasting some Metallica or some crazy music that I don't relate to, or, you know, dudes smoking a whole bunch of weed and I can't concentrate. Um, I'm not someone who burns the night, the midnight oil. I'm pretty much nine to five. I'm blowing glass in the morning with uh, with Bruce Suba. And then I come here and do my thing. So it's a very set schedule person. Um, so I kind of need that organization. So for me now, having things where they are is a little more, um, it's just, it's more preferred. But, you know, back in the day, um, yeah, it was the madness and just learning was, was the best way. Yeah. Oh, Percy. Hey, Percy. Hello again. <laughs> um, thinking about sort of how I would like to learn, I think uh, over the last five or so years, uh, it's been teaching uh, or assisting with teaching. And what I enjoy from that part of that perspective, I don't have to initially lead the classes, but I get both like this intimate knowledge and kind of conversation with the instructor but I also get to to view the students and see what they're doing and see ideas I thought about once just to materialize from people from a different perspective. Um, but the, the core part of that is that whether or not I'm going to travel to meet someone in particular um, or to meet a group of different people working in various stages of the co-learning process, it is being somewhere different with different people, I think, helps me quite a lot. But I do value sort of the mentorship one-on-one -on -one quite a bit. And that mostly has been kind of determined by having to bid out what time I had available in conflict with a, a specific work schedule. And so like choosing between sort of traveling to teach with someone, which also helps me build a knowledge and builds that community, or taking a class for myself, I couldn't quite do both of those. So I'd rather make that be teach alongside someone as an assistant or as as, as a teaching uh, teaching aid or a co-teacher uh, i felt that helped me a lot more in learning about things but you know hey i took a class with sally and that sharpened me up quite a bit i love the way that sally teaches um and that helped me kind of dig deeper into the flame working aspect to connect the dots a bit more and it's simple lessons like that that can really get you somewhere absolutely thanks percy uh brian and then we're going to switch it over to Madeline. So go ahead, uh, go ahead, Brian, unmute yourself. All right. Yeah. Um, I have kind of a meandering past with learning. Uh, it started with ceramics. I have my BFA in mm -hmm. ceramics, so I went to school with that. And 
that was really and just going to um, school for general art stuff was interesting and learning in that respect. But then once I started flame working, um, there weren't a lot of classes that were available at the time. So really working around others and working in collaboration on projects has been a big part of learning for me with mm -hmm. uh, working. And it still continues to be and to be able to travel and work that way. Um, I think it's interesting in that if you take a class from someone, you're more apt to try and recreate what you saw. Whereas if you collaborate with someone, you learn, but maybe internalize things and put your own mix on something and not necessarily recreate that, but definitely learn different techniques. And a lot of flame work, I think, is just really trying to have the piece survive. So survival techniques has been a big thing. And that's something everybody shares and learns and everybody wants to see the piece survive, whatever you're making. So. Definitely can relate to that. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, all right, so at this point, I'm gonna um, pass it over to Madeline, who's gonna, um, who's gonna continue on here. So take it away, Madeline. <laughs> hey, thanks. Um, this has been a great discussion so far. I'm loving it. Um, so I just wanted to sort of pivot a little bit um, to a related question, which is about safety. Um, and my question is, what do you look for in a shared space that makes you feel like you want to work there? Um, what is a safe space like to you? I know that term like is kind of an umbrella term, but but what um you know what what does that mean to you? This could be like a physical safety, emotional or social safety of a sh of a shared space. Um, so this this question could be you know taken in many different ways, but seeing as so many studios are either like personally privately put together or you know put together without like a consensus necessarily of um how everything, you know, is assembled. Um, you know, I'm just curious about that. If any, anyone has anything they want to add about what they feel is safe. Kristen. Sure. I got a couple things to mention about safety. Um, so when, uh, I guess the first thing I would say is, um, physical safety, as far as like feeling physically safe in a space. Um, I guess there's a couple things that we do in our space that kind of helps with that the kind of the flow of our of our workspace um, when we go over and kind of look at our space later uh, our workbench is set up like a big bullseye and um and we often describe it as like the most dangerous space in the middle and it kind of gets safer as you move further out to where the bodies are and okay. so um that kind of gives you you know all the sharp stuff all the hot stuff kind of goes into the center right and and all your hot ends are pointed away and and everything goes in so like we talk about that as far as like an actual like physical safety of the space, um, you know, ventilation, uh, proper flooring, that kind of stuff becomes an issue when you have other people in your space. Um, but uh, even more so, I guess, personally, uh, I don't like to be in a, in, a, in a studio where people are drinking alcohol. Um, that's a personal thing. Uh, cigarette smoke, um, any kind of like even joints and people smoking joints and like having them like just sitting there and like burning off on their bench and just having that additional smoke in your space that kind of tends to bother me when I'm working in a public space. Um, we keep our uh, propane bench or propane tanks underneath our benches. And so I'm always telling people, you know, like it's important that uh, if, you know, like I just, I'm just uncomfortable, I guess, with the idea of there being like cigarettes and joints and stuff like that kind of like sitting in our space it is tend to get um, put down and walked away from. And that makes me, you know, and then like, and like I said, like the additional fuming and that kind of thing. And that's just me. That's just my personal thing. And again, like with the alcohol, that's just like my own personal thing. Um, I've just been in situations in um, different open studios where people have been drinking and just kind of gets uncomfortable when you're like in a hot glass environment. And um, I like to feel like there's a little bit more professionalism than that, I guess. Um, and then, uh, I don't know. Those are kind of like my, that's when I think of safety stuff, I guess. <laughs> uh, attitude a little bit. Um, I guess I can mention that I've been in a lot of private studios or where people, you kind of come in and it can be difficult, you know, when you're working on something for a long time and things fall and they smash and they break or you're like, 
you're at the end of your rope and like these are the, like, the last dollars that you have or you're like the 10th time you've worked on this project for somebody or whatever the deal is, you know, and like um, having those emotions escalate in, um, in a public setting um, that can be kind of nerving, you know, unnerving when you're like already like trying to focus, you're trying to work on your own thing. Somebody's like yelling from across the room, you know, or smashing something um, that can make you feel unsafe when you're like, dude, I just want to like focus, you know, like I need to like be able to work on my thing and I don't need all this extra drama around me. Um, so like, I, I've, I've found that like over time, um, limiting how long I allow people to kind of come and be a part of our home environment, because it is a home, home studio, um, that allows a lot of that stuff to not, not really get to that level, I guess you could say, you know, like, um, uh, uh, I, I, do have pretty much a strict like no cigarettes on the property kind of rule anyway on the farm. So I just invite people to like take a walk. You know, I guess smoke a cigarette, just go for a walk down the street. It's a beautiful space. There's lots to look at. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But other than that, I think that um, those would be the things I would say mostly relate to as far as like safety is concerned um, in my in my studio. Great, thanks, Kristen. Yeah. So a lot of great, um, a lot of great points. Um, Amy, go ahead. Well, one of the, one of the things that's big for me and, and it's, it's, um, be mentioned in the chat a little bit as well is, um, if there are like boundary issues, uh, having like, if I'm in a group space and I want to work, uh, being respected and also being respected in my person, in my time and also in my work, you know, like as far as other people, lifting ideas or whatever things that can happen, whether there's a dynamic with a group of people. Um, and also uh, Alyssa wrote in the chat, if any issues arise, they're properly addressed. And I just want to echo that because I, I do, I had to leave a studio recently because there was no, um, if there was a dispute, there was no way to settle the dispute. And so the dispute would just escalate. And that's a situation for me that makes me feel unsafe when there's no communication or bad communication to resolve problems. Because in a group space, there's always going to be, you know, um, like potential conflicts that arise. But if there's good communication, you can nip it in the bud before it becomes a conflict. So I think that's especially important. Mm, definitely. That's, that's a great point. Davis, go ahead. Hi. Um, so ventilation is safety. First off, I actually just heard a little horror story about some improper ventilation, if you want to hear later. Um, one thing I was just thinking about, because I work in a very small studio in my flame working studio, and then Tyler, which is a very large studio, um, and going off the kind of institution thing, um, I guess there are so many, like, protocols and safety and, like, safety checks and everything but it is so large sometimes i worry about the small things falling through and um we're struggling with technicians and hiring people and it just seems really silly in an institution that like we currently have no band-aids in the studio because we have to order them through the right channels and it's so i have my little pack i brought to my office and that's they're my band-aids mm -hmm. um Safety wise, otherwise though, like especially with flame working, I feel like flame working is a thing that people see as individualistic and they say, I can go off on my own and do it my own way. And it leaves people very unchecked. So I've walked into a lot of studios that had a glass lathe and just uh, piles and piles of broken glass all around the hoses. Uh, flame workers in my building who have set off the fire alarms. Um, Flame working studios near my building I've been into that I realized had guns in them. Didn't realize till later kind of thing. Um, initially, when you think of, when I thought safety, I was thinking safe space and I'm like, oh, my street is very queer. Uh, it wasn't always that queer. And then it kind of happened that way. And now we're trying to keep it that way. I am very grateful that most of the studios I've entered are pretty female dominated or queer dominated as well. Maybe not dominated, but um, at least very open to that. You know, like the institution is great because that stuff doesn't fly. And that's kind of, it's like keeps it in check for me. And everywhere else has to be like under my responsibility, which I'm like, 
happy to do. Um, other than that, like flame working, it does seem like it's not too hard to mess up, which is good. I did really like that video from Champs recently of the oxygen line exploding, though, because I've never heard it and I wanted to see what that was like. But that's why we all have flashback arresters. So that's another thing. That Oof, I gotta check that video out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that that makes me think. Like you know, it sometimes people don't like to you know scare new students or whatever with horror stories or like a picture of a, you know, a compressed oxygen tank going through a brick wall or whatever. But I, I feel like, you know, it's good to, I, I like to show that kind of, like show just my students a video of like tomatoes getting like, um, be, representing human eyeballs and like what it's like if a piece of glass breaks near the eyeball and just like that image of glass, like impaled in like a peeled tomato skin. It was just disgusting. Um, really, yeah, very visceral. So, um, all right, uh, Sally, <laughs> you go ahead. Um, yeah, I've been in some um, some studios that are really unsafe, especially back in the 70s. We were doing a lot of things that just I just can't even believe, you know. Um, so I think having clear um, kind of rules and I think that's what the universities do for me here is that we have a union and we um you know you have to respect each other and blah 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 you know that's very helpful um it's helpful to have somebody come in the studio and say hey this is unsafe this is you know you know um not okay and you have to change it um you know i i have seen when I worked for AT&T and Bell Labs, we were working 55 pounds pressure of hydrogen coming in on one inch lines. And there was this guy, he goes, I'm gonna make a quartz torch. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. It was a real macho shop. There was nothing there for me to, like you were saying, Amy, nothing to, to go to somebody and say, hey, this is not okay. This shouldn't be happening in this studio. And so what I did is, when he was ready to light the torch, I said, well, you know, I'm just going to take a walk right now. <laughs> and I walked outside. And when I heard it blow up, I just kind of like, OK, now I can go back in. You know, <laughs> like, But, you know, it's just, you know, how do you deal with unsafe things, too? Um, you know, making things clear in the beginning what's OK and what's not OK is is good. I don't know. <laughs> We've seen a lot. <laughs> Beth has seen a lot, too, I think. Beth Island. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> I guess that like, true. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like sometimes there might be unprecedented situations, like someone wanting to make a, you know, quartz torch uh, in that hydrogen situation. Like, well, what's the rule with that? Well, we don't know. Best thing I can do is say, I'm not going to condone this and, you know, stand there and witness it. I guess, um, you know, that's a way of, responding to that but yeah the question is often like who, whose responsibility is it to be like the safety um safety police um and it, i think it really differs from one um every institution um and i i think that you know it there is a difference between you know an institutional studio and a private studio and um often you know the responsibility like for an institution or a school Often people go there and they take their first flame working class there and then they go set up their own studio or something like that. So I, I just strongly believe that the institutions need to at least show like that they're there that they have, say, ventilation, that they're like taking precautions, because often in my experience as a teacher, like students will they don't see ventilation hoods. And I've been in studios like that, that um, they don't have any ventilation. They're not going to know that it's necessary to have ventilation. Um, and how are they going to learn if that's the one class they ever take? And then they're just, you know, learning off YouTube for the rest of the time. So I think, you know, it's important conversation. Um, and it's sort of, uh, it's a little bit of elusive conversation seeing as every studio is different, but I think it is an important thing to talk about. And I always talk about it with my students, like, Ventilation in here is, you know, what it is. I wouldn't do fuming in here or et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I do think there's a responsibility there. Um, <laughs> propane tank can shoot through the ceiling. That's great. We got to watch all these videos. <laughs> um, 
at the same time, you know, we don't want to terrify ourselves into you know, being too scared to turn on the torch. So it's an interesting um, balance there. Does anyone else have anything they want to share about feelings of safety and, you know, whether it's social, emotional, physical? Um, go ahead, Mose. Um, I guess I'll just add this and, you know, um, I don't know if, you know, you guys have thought and felt the same. Um, I've been in a lot of spaces where, um, where I'm just going to go ahead and say it. No one, please take no offense. Um, but it's like, you know, like that's some white boy shit. Um, you know, basically is, you know, like how it is and, you know, like how I was raised, um, you know, my parents just didn't raise me that way. So the, a lot of the things like I think um, Sally had, um, you know, mentioned just don't feel safe to me. Just doesn't feel like a good habit, good practice. I'm a very, for people who know me, I'm a very spiritual energy person. So I just don't want that type of energy um, just to be around. You know, I don't care if the pieces I sell for a gazillion dollars. If I don't like the vibes, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to put myself in that situation. You know, um, I currently work with someone who is brass, you know, like he is a very like, hey, maybe you shouldn't say that type of person. Um, and it took me a long, like, I don't say a long time, but, you know, almost a whole year to like figure out the balance. So I was like, I got to work with this person. Um, and, you know, he's just going to say things and I have to be able to protect my energy and myself in this space um, because this is paying my bills. So how do I deal with that? And I think a lot of people, because it's such a white dominant space, you just like, ah. and um, that's, you know, and you're not really considerate of how other people are feeling and how they lived, how they were brought up. And, and I think that is a thing that, you know, needs to be discussed more. Um, but it's definitely one of the things why I said why I just built my own temple. Um, because, you know, like trying to go to someone else's isn't for me a safe space and I don't feel comfortable there. And I think that's something that, you know, as, as you know, this, this craft, this art, whatever you want to call it progresses, um, and more inclusiveness happens and things like that. I think it's good to get, um, an idea of how other people have lived and bring that energy in those environments to the space instead of just being like, oh, you know, this is how we, how it's, this is how the Italians did it, so this is how we're going to fucking do it. Um, I'm, that's just not, you know, like, I'm not Italian. You know, that's, the, the, the techniques are cool, but outside of that, you know, like, there's no relation there. Um, so I feel like, you know, moving forward and I guess being a new generation type of person, that it should be in a space, you know, like creating spaces where we all feel safe. Um, I think that's just, you know, when when that happens, you get the best out of people, not just artistically in what they're making, but also just like you get their personalities open up. You know, they really start to feel comfortable. I had to adapt because I'm just, I'm a black man in a white world, so I just always have to adapt. And I, I figured out how to adapt and make the energy where I work a lot better because I, I I did that. But like, if I was to ask that to the other person to do that, I would just be wasting my time. Um, and a lot of times that's like that. So I think that's just something to consider moving forward um, when, you know, you're building these institutes and you're, you know, um, trying to figure out how to continue the old ones is how other people might feel in the situation I know geeks and you know crafting the future and better together are working on this but you know a lot of times it's like we just don't want to feel like oh well we're the token black guys here you go here's how things are like that's not it's not going to make me feel like i'm a good artist or anything so it's just like i think more consideration of like how people are actually feeling um in the space is um something that we need to address instead of just making them like adapt to what's going on Thank you for sharing that, Chris. Um, I think that's such a great point and so such an important one. Um, and I guess like in a really just general way, sort of for me, I think so much about like 
just the vibes of a place. And if it's dominated by a certain, you know, demographic, like white people, black, um, white people, male, like whoever, like, um, are the vibes, like, are they welcoming to outsiders? Are they welcoming to people who maybe don't look like them? Like, um, I'm sorry, my cat is going crazy. Um, and yeah, so much is just like the vibes that we're putting out and like, um, and just being aware of that. So yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Um, Surf rat, why why don't you go ahead? Sorry. Yeah, um, really good points. Uh, I think one other thing that I've noticed evolving throughout lamp working and flame working in general is uh, ventilation during demos and flame offs and safety practices. I mean, first demos I ever went to at the Seattle gas conference in like 2003, it was in a room, no ventilation, crazy. Some of the first flame offs I ever went to no ventilation, 20 torches and continuing into like some of these Vegas events, no ventilation, other things. I think it's interesting. It doesn't really shine the best light on practices. And it also is just, eh, it's just an interesting uh, observation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, something might seem fine. Like we set up for a demo in one day for, for one day. And we're like, well, we don't need ventilation. It's fine. Like, but then it turns out like, you know, thousands of people see that demo and they, that's what sort of gets spread as like, oh, is that a, is that, a, is that acceptable? Um, so I, I think that's like often demos are some of the most public things, but we skirt a lot of the lines of safety um, for those. So very interesting. Um, just going back a little in the chat, Joe said, along the lines of what Moses is saying, I feel like I've had to figure out how to deal um, deal with the things that go on in the studios I work in, because for me, it's kind of the price of access. I end up having to figure out what I can and cannot deal with and just manage that on my own. This sometimes end with ends up with being that I don't work in that studio or that equipment. Um, uh, Percy says a, a sense of organization and care is important for the space to feel safe and welcoming in public spaces. Um, to feel safe and welcoming in public spaces, I feel cared for when technicians or staff check in on renters. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, just like even just you know checking in, being kind and friendly. Um, it's just so important for you know being welcoming and and for for feeling welcome for the for the new people. Um, Sean, go ahead. Hey, nice to see you. My connection's not great. Um, that was a great segue. I wanted to say hi to this group um, and welcome you all to get involved. We have a brand new flame working studio that's going to be opening at the University of Washington in two or three weeks. Um, great ventilation, um, an accessible height bench that's plumbed with flexible hoses. Hopefully, the flow's good. I'm not a flame worker. Mark Zerpel left as the space was beginning the feasibility study. So I've been the point person for the design with the help of David Willis. And um, we have ongoing opportunities for uh, visiting faculty to come in. And we're in the midst of a search for our full-time tenure track position in glass. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. I'm, I'm super grateful to be on this email list because I feel like this is a great um, meeting of the minds in the flame working realm. So I just wanted to offer that up. <clears throat> Thanks, Sean, that's so exciting. So great to hear that there's a new it's, flame working studio. <laughs> I know, we're sort of headed the opposite direction of everybody else. <laughs> so I, hear, I keep hearing uh, programs shutting down and, um, and the University of Washington has given, uh, the whole first floor of the School of Art has been remodeled with a new gallery, a new ceramic studio, a new flame working studio, um, and a new wood shop and um, digital fabrication studio. So it's going to be a it's going to be a nice space, and uh, I hope we got the flame working studio right. <clears throat> oh, that's so, awesome! Yeah, it's it's very exciting. Wow. Well, I can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see pictures. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, I'll share I'll share some pictures as as soon as it. Uh, they're just doing the sheetrock now and finalizing the power and the gas lines and all of it. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's been exciting to work with the engineers and the architects and we're going to have the propane on scales and heating blankets and, you know, remote control to, you know, check the levels on the propane and, you know, shut off manifolds, auto shut off manifolds for the oxygen so we can swap out a bank of tanks 
one at the other. I mean, we were wheeling tanks down the hallway in the art building. You know, it was it's going to be such a such a different world. So I'm super excited. But yeah, stay tuned. How awesome. I love, you know, seeing institutions and universities build new flameworking studio and also you know, make safety a priority too. Yeah, um, that was priority vision. number one for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's sweet. Yeah, putting that on blast, like just being like, here's a great example for all the other, you know, teachers, institutions trying to think of like, dreaming about doing that. It's mm -hmm. a great to have a good example. Um, and Sean mentioned something too about uh, like a wheelchair accessible um, flame, flame working bench, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. So the studio is ADA compliant and we have two out of the 14 workstations are at sort of the end of the bank of, uh, of torches. So we have an instructor bench on one short end and then the opposite short end is two workstations. That is an adjustable height bench that's connected to flexible hose. And then we'll have the regulators sort of ride up and down with the bench. Um, and so it's not, it's not like a crank or anything. It's just like set pins. So it'll be set for the quarter. But if we have students that have those needs, then we'll set them up at those benches and, and they'll be good to go for the quarter. That's great. I mean, it's amazing just how, um, so to create accessibility in the studio, one huge thing is just having adjustable size benches for people, mm -hmm. in wheelchairs and different heights of wheelchairs for people who need to sit, need to stand. Yeah. Um, that opens up so yeah. much accessibility. Yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful that, that it was, and we have, you know, our population is, you know, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of people that aren't that tall, <laughs> um, you know, so so th there's sort of a standard, it feels like, and I shaved two inches off of it because our standard isn't, the, you know, it's different. Our demographic is different. And so um, I hope we I hope we did a good job. But yeah, we do have that one adjustable height bench and um, it's going to be, it's Nate Watson is, <laughs> talking about putting him on blast, Nate Watson is not a flame worker and he's going to be teaching in there for the first quarter that we are up. Awesome. Um, and that's in... Yeah, this spring, spring quarter at UW. So, um, yeah, it'll be it'll be fun. It'll be great. It's it's primarily an intro, you know, studio. That's sort of one of our um, ways that we get people interested in glass. It's on the main campus where our our three D studio is down a ways away. So we sort of it's our sort of funneling students in from the wider university into our program is through flame working and ceramics in the main campus. So, anyway, I just wanted to share that. I don't want to take up too much time. So cool. Um, yeah, and one comment you made about like, um, you know, the height uh, of you know, benches are often like made for someone who's really tall. It makes me think of like, for example, whenever I go to sandblast at a school, the sandblaster is always made for a giant with like crazy long arms and you try to get in there and you're like this isn't this is clearly made for a very specific size person um so i think that you know t for studios moving ahead thinking about accessibility and taking it into account like the different types of bodies that people have and people come with um and and having just building in a little bit of flexibility can the can the table be heightened or, or lower um can we move everything out of the way to you know allow a 33 inches for a wheelchair to get through um can we prioritize sweeping the glass, the broken glass off the floor, so someone you know in a wheelchair doesn't pop their tires, um, totally. and um, and that makes me that brings me to like sort of something else I was thinking about in terms of accessibility, which is um, yeah, just access for different types of disabilities in glass because you know for so long there's I think been a um, overarching idea that like you have to be really strong to be a glass worker to you know work in crafts, especially um, hot glass and. I really think there's starting to be an attitude shift and I'm, I'm hoping I'm excited about it, um, about creating um, an accessible sort of inclusive environment to people with different types of abilities. So for instance, I am an ambulatory wheelchair user. That means that I walk sometimes, sometimes I use a wheelchair because I have a chronic pain thing going on. Um, and you know, I, on the first day of school, I started telling my students that just so they don't like get confused. They, so they know what's going on. And I've always been so nervous to, to stare that because it feels almost taboo. Like what's a, what's a disabled class floor doing in a class studio? Like that's so weird. Um, but they've been receptive and, and more and more recently students have been coming up to me and saying, thank you so much 
for just sharing that. Like, I had no idea that you had that, that you were disabled or whatever. And that is so great for me because, you know, I have this, this, I have this situation, this chronic illness, this disability, this mental health problem that, you know, everyone has different things, but they affect them in the same way. Um, and so much of it is just like, as a teacher, for, for me, some of it is just being honest and, you know, sharing like, hey, this is, this is my situation. Like, I can still work. You can do it too. Um, and I, it's, I'm just blown away by like the responses I've started getting from students once I started opening up about that. Um, and people are messaging me on like strangers are messaging me on Instagram being like, I'm taking a glass blowing class. I use crutches cause I have, you know, EDS. I can't, you know, stand for long periods of time. And my, my teacher thinks I shouldn't take the class. Like, what do I do? And I'm like, <laughs> I think you got to talk to the school and, you know, they have to accommodate you if it's a college. Um, but, you know, I've started like creating more and more conversations um, and just raising awareness that, you know, it just sometimes takes like a few changes, like the teacher allowing a student to bring a stool and watch a demo while they can sit down. Like it might not seem big for some people, but it's huge for other people. Um, and I just think that, you know, an attitude shift um, about like used to think that you, know, you had to give all you had to drive your body into the ground when you're blowing glass. Like as a college student, I was like, if you're not dying on the floor when you're done, you didn't give it your all. You didn't do a good job. You didn't try your best. And just like, like a little bit more recently, like, well, maybe you can be kind to your body. You can work within your limits. And that still means you can do your best and you can think conceptually. You can work strategically with peers to help you, you know, access the hot shop in ways you might not alone. Um, so I'm very curious and kind of excited about this sort of new attitude shift that I'm hoping for. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to share that with you all. And I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that, but Go ahead, Brian. Uh, yeah, just real quick. I mean, I think the longer you work in any kind of craft, the more, I mean, you know, hunching over posture, all those issues, you build up pain issues or dealing with working through that with your body. And I mean, working on a lathe has been a huge shift for me, being able to work larger glass while not being in pain. I literally making pendants had well, my back go out on me. So I think that paying attention to this for anybody of any condition size anything trying to dial it in so they're not in pain is really important exactly yeah the lathe is such a great tool for saving your body um beth go ahead <laughs> um i think i'll share what's going on with me as i'm losing my vision in one eye so I am really struggling when I'm using the torch or a lot of other uh, artistic ventures with depth perception. And I'd be interested if anybody has any tips on that kind of thing. Um, how do I, until my brain catches up with where the vision is, trying to figure out where I am as, in space is kind of a challenge. So, um, ways to compensate for that and ways to save the vision I've got. Mm. So that's another safety issue that we hadn't touched on. Yeah. So. Thanks for sharing that, Beth. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is, yeah, the, the vision, that is something we haven't touched on. Um, and it is a, it's a great point. And um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has dealt with, I do have students from time to time saying like I have depth, perce depth perception issues okay. and I don't know what, to, I don't know how to help them. I, cause I, that's something I'm familiar with personally. So, um, that's a great, um, great question. Um, I don't know if anyone has any responses to that. Um, so I see Sally and Amy have their hands up. Sally, you want to um, go ahead? Yeah, Beth. Yeah, Beth, you might want to try putting something dark. This is what I tell students when they have depth perception problems is to okay. take, you know, maybe some graphite, a graphite pad and put it be between the flame, you know, in your eyes. And then you have the graphite, you know, so you're kind of looking at that graphite through the flame. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. Um, putting something dark behind there. You know, I don't have the depth perception thing, but that's what people have told me that has helped um, with that. I'll try it. Thank so, you. Yeah, yeah. And 
And one thing I'll, I'll just have to bring up Penland again. Um, they talk about movement all the time. You start your day with a movement class. It's open for anybody to go. And then you can have the movement instructor come into your class and talk about how people are sitting and standing and working. Um, and I think that's important. If you can find a, a movement teacher that could come into your studio or into your class and watch you work and see how you can change how you work. That's great. Thanks, Mo. See you later. Have a nice class. Um, so Sally, you just you um you put a black sort of background behind the flame or it covers up the flame so no, it it's like it. on the table. It's on the table. Okay. So then it'll just allow focus more. Yeah. And um I don't know, that seems to so far people say that that helps. Another thing I do, sometimes I have people that have real shaky hands and I'll make a brace for their hand right next to the torch. Um, or if they're on the lathe, how can you brace that hand? You know, can you bring a, a yoke over and adjust the yoke so that they can put their hand right there with their, you know, hand torch? You know, what kind of hoses do you have on the hand torch? If you have these big, heavy honking hoses on your hand torch and you're working on the lathe all day, that's gonna wear out your wrists, you know? Um, yeah. Is that good? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's Thanks, right. Sally. Yeah. Um, that's a great, I, I never occurred to me. And, and I see Percy um, says that he also does that has like a, a sort of a background or something black surface behind the flame. That's a, I have to try that. Um, maybe I'll paint my workstation black. <laughs> um, cool. Amy, what do you have to add? Uh, I think Sally kind of touched on it, but I, I don't have vision issues, but I, I have a lot of experience working with students who have all different abilities. And one of the one of the things that's that works pretty well, I think, is um, for beginners, especially using a set of rollers and then just helping this helping, you know, find the, the point in the flame where you're going to be working most and set the rollers right there. So you always have that spot to come back to as a point of reference. Um, and especially in terms of like depth, depth perception, it, in the, if the flame is at an angle, it can be difficult to try to like keep the glass in the flame. So maybe consider something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great idea too. Cause like it eliminates the variable of where, where am I holding the glass in space? It's always goes right back to that well, one spot. And not only that, but in a, in a group studio environment, it's like a way to adapt to address your own like depth perception issues without like what like kind of slickly you know like without calling attention to yourself or anything like that so that's mm -hmm. another thing to not you know just you know uh smoothly kind of um doing your work without needing a whole bunch of accommodations or anything like that so yeah totally awesome i love these davis um, I just want to say in general that I'm super grateful for environments like this that help prepare me for teaching when it comes to people who have those uh, different abilities. Uh, this semester, two students came up to me. My first student was like, I'm completely deaf in my right ear. I'm like, oh, good. That's the side I basically will be talking to you from the entire time. Um, I have another student who has blood pressure issues and faints easily. And so far, everything's gone very well this semester, but I could tell that because of how gently I approached those topics, they felt comfortable enough to talk to me. And I feel that in another sense, maybe they would have not. And I'm just super grateful for having this group to prepare me for situations like that and how to approach them gently as someone who doesn't come from those uh, disabilities, but who needs to work with them and learn how to work with them the most effectively and gently. That's wonderful. Thanks, Davis. Yeah, there's not like, because since every body is different, it's like, well, how do you work with a person who's deaf in one ear? I, you know, and you never know. Like I've worked with people, students who are deaf and there's an interpreter in the class. And that's that was an awesome, cool learning curve um, at RIT. But everyone, you know, um, 
I, I mean, for me, at least, like, I find, like, one great thing is just, like, talking to the student one-on-one and being, like, what can I do to help you? So I don't have to, you know, talk about it in the front of the class unless you want to be open and be, like, this is why this person it needs a chair or whatever. Um, we can be open about it. We can be discreet and just taking it case by case. But I'm that's lovely to hear. So thanks for sharing that, Davis. Um, Great. So I think um, it's about 830. And, um, you know, I think we could get to the portion of doing a little rapid fire studio tour. If anyone is interested um, in sharing their space, absolutely no pressure. Uh, we won't we won't judge you if you got a messy bench. <laughs> um, and I know Amy is here at the Glass Center and she's uh, going to just show us um, a little bit of the of the Salem Glass Center. And I just want to say, uh, sorry that we're just getting to this now. I know there were a few people who got to tap out who wanted to be a part of this. So if you're tuning in after, sorry, maybe we'll have to make another session where we can look at studios because it seems to be something we all want to do. But I can show you here. I'm here at the Glass Center. So I'll just give you a little quick tour. So we're in um, a giant warehouse basically here um, that houses all of our shops. So we have a hot shop, cold shop back there. A uh, uh, kiln shop, and then we have two teaching studios for flame working. Um, so here's our scientific shop. Here, there's a class in progress now. Carl Napolitano. Here we go. So I think there's about let's see, twenty benches in each shop. Hey, Evelyn. And then in the middle, there's Evelyn. In the middle here, let's see, we've got our banks of lathes, and so the lathes are shared by both um, shops. And then over here we have this second flame shop is more geared towards sculpture. Um, we have the kiln set up and it's set up a little bit different from scientific with a little bit different equipment. But everything is open and accessible so that when we're teaching, we can kind of float in and out of shops depending on what equipment we're gonna use, which is really great. So it's crowded tonight. There's our kilns. And then we also have, a. Um, that there's a cold shop. We also have um, fabrication. We build equipment here. There's our hot shop. So the shop is set up so that we can easily go like from the hot shop to the flame shop and back, um, which is also really handy. Uh, and then also just very flexible um, to make any kind of glass art you want, basically. So thanks for looking. <laughs> so cool. Thanks, Amy. It's really great to see the studio, even though I've been there a million times. I'm like, oh, it looks so cool on my phone right now. <laughs> um, yeah, nice place to roll the lathe into the hot shop. So I just popped on my phone real quick so I can show you all my uh, studio in progress. Hopefully um, you, I can take you with me outside just so you can see this is brand new, um, brand new studio here that we're setting up uh, in my backyard. And uh, or, um, basically here in progress. We got some women here or maybe working and uh, some kiln space and it's about um, by nine feet or so. So it's very exciting. Um, not much, not much happened here yet. We have to put the as like I've always wanted my own spot and you can see the crown jewel. <laughs> Is this ace bag which will heat it and cool it? I'm so probably the ventilation will pull her out, but <laughs> we'll be and uh, so yeah, the, the kind of funny thing is um so we had a uh shed here existing already we did it was really fun. Oh it's not really worth it. So um uh, we uh, tore it down and we, we made the size of this space just 
small enough so that we didn't have to get a variance for it because otherwise you have to apply for a zoning variance and that's a whole like appeal to committees and stuff because it's in like historic Philadelphia and a real headache so I wanted to make the space bigger but my husband was like we can't he's an architect um, and so he knows the hell of going through a variance and he's like we have to make it just the size no bigger it'll be fine um and so the key is high ceiling spaces um really make what seems like a small space feel a lot bigger um so there's a little sneak peek of what's come. <laughs> I'm going to head back inside. Would anybody else like to share a space? No pressure. Uh, if not, I'm just going to um, pipe. Go ahead. I'm I'm just gonna pipe in pipe in here and just say uh, I know that Kristen we're looking forward to sharing the studio too and I'm, I'm so sorry we we went over a little over with the, the discussion so uh, but it's great to have an example of at least like you know a group studio and a private studio too so so Oh my god. 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 Wait, 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 wait. wait. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. Making experimental music here. Yes, exactly. So, um, hopefully, we can do another one again um, and see the rest of your spaces. Um, and thanks for looking. So, um, I think to wrap this up is um, Amy and I compiled a list of residencies and scholarships that are available to flame workers that have uh, studios with flame working access. So. We're gonna pop it into the chat, and then if anyone has anything to add as well, um, oh, you already did that, so perfect. Um, feel free to, to pop them in the chat, and we'll make it um, accessible to everybody. So, also, I want to add that um, after all these meetings, if you're not aware, uh, we go through and compile meeting notes. So, um, all this information will be accessible to you in the future as reference, and I will go through in the meeting notes and put links to everything as well. Um, so if you drop a link in there for an opportunity or an opportunity name, I can go in and get the link and pop it in there and that'll be available in the meeting notes. So you'll have that. Perfect. Um, awesome. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll pass it back over to Amy and I think we, you know, we're about ready to wrap up here and thank you so much everyone for your, uh, for coming and for joining the conversation today. Absolutely. I, I second that. Thank you so much. It's it's we've been doing this for two years. We've had six meetings and thank you all so much for coming on this journey with us. It's great to see regular um, friends joining and then new faces each time to um, joining in the conversation. And um, I I hope it continues. I hope to see you next season. And um, yeah, I hope you all have a good summer until then. And thanks so much for taking the time to to come to the meeting and also to to join in the conversation um yeah thanks a lot <laughs> absolutely thanks so much all and yeah we'll see you we'll see you next time mm -hmm. thank you <laughs> great to see your faces <laughs> yes <laughs> hey this is emily from geeks aka the glass education exchange Geeks is an online platform connecting people and sharing materials in the collective field of glass education. That's a bit of a mouthful. So what does it actually mean? Geeks creates supportive spaces outside of traditional academic structures to offer community building programming and resources. Programs like the Flame Affinity Group offer a space for constructive dialogue between practitioners in the field. We're hoping to nudge the field of glass into its next generation through new models of community support. This recording is also available through one of our initiatives, the Glass Resource Exchange. The Glass Resource Exchange is a user-contributed library collecting and sharing educational material like articles, supply lists, videos, and more. We're hoping to see it grow as a common resource supporting Glass teaching and learning. Want to support geeks? Small donations really help us continue building our communal programming. Alternatively, you can subscribe to our lecture series featuring outstanding glass artists and researchers. Learn more at geeks.glass support. 
Thanks for watching. Want updates on new Geeks programs and resources? Follow at Geeks Glass on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, or visit our website, geeks.glass. Thanks again and stay tuned.